I think I, I uh, have been seduced by the fact that this is my backyard. This is, uh, Eddie's from Altoona, and well, everyone here tonight is from the area, but this is literally my backyard. When, when my brother Gary and Bill and I were, and the neighborhood kids were growing up, these were the places we ran and uh, got in trouble and learned how to climb trees and whatever. And uh, so I thought probably the best thing to do is to just walk down there. I walked from the lane down and tell people what's in your heart. And so kind of un not prepared. Uh, and I find it overwhelming, you know, to, to be here tonight, see so many people that were so instrumental. Um, in just helping raise you, you know, be a part of your life. Uh, I don't think that uh, it's been clearly established what is the most dominant effect in creating a person. I don't think they've established if it's more genetic than it is environment. But uh, I suppose until they do establish that, it's safe to say that it's an equal measure of both. All of us here that you have so richly honored uh, our, whatever genetic gifts we're given are known to God only, I suppose. Our environment, we've all tried to speak about tonight and, and tried to speak about those people that were loomed extremely large in our environment. And uh, I'm not going to go too long, but I want to talk about a couple. Uh, you, you, there's no honor you could give me that would equal the honor of having simply having Steve Smear take time out of his life to come here and be with me this evening. Um, I don't have anything really funny to say about Steve other than the one thing that I know and I've always known that I'd do better than Steve. I did better back then, I'd do better than now, is play the piano. But I've... <laughs> Steve was the kind of guy, uh, Joe, I'm going to steal some of Joe's thunder because if he got around to saying this, I know he was going to throw this shot in. Steve was the kind of guy who always made the play. And he always accused, and Joe always accused me of being the guy who jumped, was the last one to jump on the pile. <laughs> It'd be the first one everyone saw at the end of the play. I and mean, so, <laughs> getting the credit. And uh, you know, I always took offense at that, good-naturedly, uh, until uh, hopefully the, the older we get, the more we find that we want to be honest with ourselves. And I find that, unfortunately, what Joe said was probably true. I think. <laughs> I think that you win 31 games in a row with guys like Steve Smear, because Steve reached a level of performance as an athlete that uh, game in and game out, he simply was not capable of playing a bad game. For me, guys like me, and I don't remember who else on the team that was like that, but there were a number of us. The pendulum swung kind of wide, and we would tear it up one week, and. Um, stink it up the next week, actually, I guess. Uh, and I, I've often thought that uh, the kind of guy that you want in a, if you wander down the wrong alley at 3 o'clock in the morning, the kind of guy you want at your side is Steve Smear. I appreciate him being here. There's another fellow that's been introduced. Uh, I didn't start in organized football uh, happily until I got to Altoona. The, I went to Logan Junior High, and of course they didn't have any organized sports at the time. and. Uh, I met Earl Strong, who was my high school coach, and I wasn't sure that he was here tonight. I was so glad to see that he was here. Um, I guess the greatest thing I can say about Earl was I remember the first time I met him, uh, I was so struck by how much he resembled my dad, a uh, guy of not a whole lot of words. And when I got to know him then, and the next year got on the varsity, I learned that Earl was a guy of not many words. He could. Uh, he was certainly a man who could motivate you with one word. And it was always a puzzle to him why a kid wouldn't give everything he had just simply to find out how good he could be. Um, he's a man of enormous dignity that always has had an effect on me. Uh, I love this, and I hope this would be taken in the spirit in which it's given. There uh, was another great fellow when I played in Altoona who was a backfield coach, Wally Fields. And um, Wally, at, it, the reputation, or at least the rumor in those days was that Earl's eyesight was less than 20-20. <laughs> uh, 
as he peered out onto the field to catch the action during a game. And Wally's Fields, who always stood next to Earl during the games, hearing wasn't, uh, <laughs> his hearing wasn't always really what it should be either. And very often in the heat of battle over in Johnstown, for example, uh, it was often, you would often hear Earl whisper in that hoarse voice of his, did he catch that, Wally? <laughs> and Wally say, what's that, Earl? <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, I'm extremely lucky for having my first organized football experience be at the hands of a man like, like Earl Strom. And then I was so excited to be recruited by Penn State. I was not recruited heavily by a lot of schools. And uh, I had a, such a great childhood. I didn't really want to go very far away from here. And Penn State was, was ideal just down the road. And I was going to have the opportunity to work with one of the great coaches of all time, Rip Engel. Uh, <laughs> who was the head coach uh, at Penn State during my freshman year. Uh, and he decided, unfortunately, to step down after my freshman year and give it to the hands of this guy who, to this day, uh, while we're, a lot of people are happy he's, uh, happy he's a football coach. I, back when I was playing for him, I was wishing he would have gotten, gone off and gotten that law degree he talked so much about <laughs> over the years. Uh, I'm not going to belabor the point of what Joe has accomplished, uh, uh, because frankly, I'm sick and tired of hearing it. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, after all these years, if I had to sum up Joe Paterno, it would be in two words, ugly pants, frankly. <laughs> and I'm not going to get, these are, these are times that we can get a little serious, but I, I suppose, the, again, I try to cite examples. And the only thing I'll tell you about Joe is, I have a three-year-old boy coming to father, Susie, my wife, is here, and I'm coming to fatherhood late in life. But happily, I'm ready for it, and it's the greatest thing that's ever happened to us. Uh, I'm not sure I want Maddie to play football. I've had knee operations and shoulders and backs, and like any, Steve's had them. Eddie, you've got them. Uh, injuries. My only wish is that, of course, if, if, if it, this it's, fates conspire to make this kid a football player, that somewhere by the time in the next uh, 15 years or whenever that's going to be, there's a Joe Paterno around that I can deliver this kid into the hands of. You know, uh, Joe, uh, when you're at Penn State, Joe is, another nice thing I can say about Joe is he's sort of a pain because he's in your, he's in your face all the time. There is, nothing, there is nothing you could do on the field that would irritate him or make him any madder than finding out that you had cut a class. Um, and I suppose I played five years in professional football and, and uh, too many games against Eddie Flanagan. Uh, I decided to quit. And I suppose Joe was probably as responsible for having me quit after five years in that I left Penn State realizing football was a, a part of the tapestry of life. And that there were other things as important, other things more important. Um, and speaking of Eddie Flanagan, um, I left Joe and Penn State and went into the pros. And uh, it's great to see Eddie Flanagan again. I don't know what you weighed then and what you weighed now, but you, then you hit like you look now, OK? <laughs> uh, and Eddie introduced a good friend of his, Bob Kowalkowski. Now, you have to understand that when we say we played against the three of us, against one another, this was nose to nose, eyeball to eyeball. Eddie was center, and Bob was the right guard, and I was our left tackle. And I remember my introduction into really growing up in the NFL uh, was Eddie and Bob. Uh, I had, we had gone into a game against Detroit. I think it was maybe on my second year. And I had had the first three games about six or seven quarterback sacks. And uh, like we all are want to do at certain points in our life, we think it's all us. You know, we, we're doing this. Uh, 
pretty full of myself and uh, I don't even remember if it was Riverfront Stadium or we played Detroit in Detroit, but the first play of the game I lined up and Bob and Eddie hit me so hard I couldn't even fall. I don't know if any of you have ever been <laughs> hit that hard, but it was hard enough to lower my IQ several points. <laughs> And I struggled to get those IQ points back unsuccessfully, I'm afraid. Uh, my last uh, thing I want to say to you is um, Wade so uh, touchingly uh, talked about his family. And how does one really talk about the family and the effect they have on you? You know, I didn't, I'm like every other kid, you know, I think, don't we, when we're growing up, we take our parents for granted. Um, but I think in probably the 80s, particularly in my case and Susan, my wife's case, when you were a new parent in the 80s, I think it kind of highlights something very important. And that is that when we were growing up, we simply never had to ever worry about, my brothers and I never had to worry about mom or dad being there. When we were kids, we never ever questioned who was going to tuck us in. We never ever questioned who was going to be there in the morning when we woke up. Uh, grouchy, and she was there with breakfast, uh, feeding a couple of ingrateful, three ingrateful whiny brats. Uh, we just simply never had to question whether mom loved dad or whether dad loved mom. We simply were a family. And consequently, we were always able, my brothers and I, able to go out and have no none of that baggage that unfortunately so many young people have because we understood that where we came from was always where we were going to come from. I don't care where I've been, whether it was Cincinnati from Pro Bowl in Nashville, when I think of the word home, I always think of Juniata Gap and Baker's Lane in this house. Um, and, you know, in 19, I guess it takes being a father in this day and age, a brand new father, to realize my wife and I we just found a house in a neighborhood in Nashville that we really love. And it's got kids in it, and it's got a bunch of wonderful people who are glad we're there, and we're glad we're there. And it's a relief to us to find a house like that. And it occurred to me one night, laying awake in bed at night, why it was a relief. Because we were so relieved that now we were in a position to give Matthew and our baby that's on the way, by the way, give Matthew and the new baby on the way what we had as children, a place that we knew, no matter how unsafe the world seemed, no matter how rough things got wherever we were, there was always some place that we knew was home. So without, I think, I, Mom, I speak on behalf of Gary, who's here, and Bill, who's not here, uh, without getting maudlin, I just thank you for being there. It, uh, I hope that I can be there in the same way for my children as you were for us. And lastly, um, I think that we'll all agree here tonight that the real star of this evening is the Hall of Fame. I think this area, I'm so proud not only to be in this group, this wonderful group, but so proud that this area, which has a wonderful, wonderful tradition of athletic accomplishment, um, I mean, I bet you couldn't fill up one hand the communities in America that have a person like Wade Chalice who has accomplished what he has accomplished in his career. And finally, we have an opportunity for every, all the young people here in this area to bring all that history, the Eddie Flanagans and the Wade Chalices and the Pat Malones and um, everybody, uh, Chuck Knox, Galen Hall, all these great accomplishments into focus, and maybe help them refocus a little bit. Uh, and for that, I, I, I think the stars of the evening are the Hall of Fame, Steve Sheets and Neil Rudell. And uh, there's no way I can aptly or, or properly thank you all for the support and for coming here tonight. And Steve and Neil, again, thank you for this uh, most important honor in my life. Thank you.